Hello, good afternoon. And uh, it's the last session, it's almost over. Goodbye. <laughs> so, uh, my name is uh, Marc Zanger. I'm uh, apparently with ARM, for, been for a while. Um, I tend to look after things like uh, KVM and also things like uh, RQ domains. And that, that's, the, um, that's the subject for today. So I've tried to have the longest possible title. I'm not sure I won't, so that means uh, um, or how uh, dealing with modern intrap architecture can uh, affect your sanity. And yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> so uh, what are we going to talk about? Uh, quickly go over what's an intrap. Wait, that won't last very long. Uh, Intrap controllers, um, what sort of data structures uh, Linux uses to represent um, intrups and intrap domain. Um, chain intrap controllers, uh, intrap controllers hierarchies, MSIs, and whatever. And the whatever is uh, <laughs> pretty nuts sometimes. Please interrupt me. Uh, if there's one thing I hate to do is to just talk on my own. That usually doesn't last very long, and I fall asleep, uh, especially as I had very little sleep lately. So please interrupt me if there's something you don't understand, something uh, where you think I'm completely wrong, which is likely. Um, please, yeah, raise your hand, scream, shout, throw something at me. Just do it. Uh, late advertisement. <laughs> So Alison did a really, really, really good talk on, um, on Tuesday. Uh, please have a look. It probably will be uploaded uh, somewhere at some point. Um, so it's, it's really orthogonal to, the, to this discussion today. It's really about the, the, the dynamics of interrupt handling um, when things get preempted and then and threaded interrupts. It's really good. So please have a look. What's an interrupt? So, Pretty simple, it's just, it's just a wire. Well, at least, it's been for a very long time just a wire um, that the device shakes repeatedly sometimes um, towards the CPU, and sometimes things happen. So what's the purpose of, of that line? It's just to indicate a condition on the device. Something has happened. What has happened is completely device dependent, but yeah. Something the device was expecting has miraculously happened, and uh, it's telling you, please go and have a look. So, as you've seen, here I have just one interrupt, one device, one line to a CPU. Of course, we, that's, that's a bit weak. We want something slightly bigger, so we like to multiplex interrupts, and for that we get the help of an interrupt controller. So, as we have you know, tons of them, uh, it's nice to have a dedicated piece of IP for that. So it's very often architecture specific, though it has a number of, um, let's say, features that we, we, we can find uh, very often, so, such as masking interrupts, uh, setting the SMP affinity, things like waking up a CPU when it's uh, in deep sleep mode, and also things Linux doesn't use, like priorities, um, features. So that's what a, an intro controller looks like from a very high level view. That's my, uh, my friend, the geek, with which I spend way, way, way too much time. Uh, sorry, fine thing. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, so if we go back, uh, that, that, yeah, that box is actually uh, a much bigger thing in real life. I mean, it deals with per CPU interrupts, deals with priorities, being, being able to, to respond to both software and hardware interaction at the same time in, in supposedly a race-free way. So it's, a, it's an interesting piece of kit. And most interrupt controllers are you know, eventually quite complicated. The closer they are to the core, the, the more complicated they are. So general stuff. There's, there's I'd say, two classes of uh, interrupt. There's the, on my left, the level-triggered interrupts. On my right, the edge-triggered interrupts. And yeah, they're not quite the same. They don't indicate the same thing. So a level triggered interrupt, which could be either low or high, depending on, on what the device and the interrupt control agree on, uh, that indicate a persistent condition. If you receive a packet on your Ethernet controller and the Ethernet controller 
tells you, I have received a packet, it could say, I have received a packet, and I, won't, I, I will keep a set that line until you come and service that interrupt, because I don't have a buffer. I, just, I can, can just hold one packet, and as long as you haven't serviced that interrupt, drain the packet out, out of the Ethernet uh, buffer, I won't be able to receive another one. So it's really persistent. Yeah. Uh, you have to do something. And then there's the opposite, which is an edge triggered interrupt, which is something has happened, and that's it. So you can, that's just a, a pulse. And most of the time, it doesn't prevent the, um, the system from carrying on working. And if, if we keep the analogy of, a, of a, an Ethernet controller, it's because that um, Ethernet controller is capable of DMAing into your into memory directly. So it doesn't really matter if you have to come and service it immediately. Um, it has all other um, interesting features, um, such as if you get two of them, well, in, in quick uh, succession, you can't really distinguish them. It's really quite likely that you will only see one. Um, they will just get uh, coalesced um, at the interrupt control level. Also, some, um, some systems just ignore the notion of, uh, of a trigger type. Uh, could be that it's abstracted, it's, it's virtualized, para-virtualized, or it's just a glorified exception handler, uh, like some architectures do, sort of. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> and now for something slightly different. And then we get into the meat of the thing. So Linux has a, a number of data structures to represent interrupts. So one of the most famous one, the RQ chip. That's a, a bunch of methods, functions, uh, function pointers, to drive the hardware. So you'll find things like mask, unmask, and interrupt, EOI, and interrupt, if, you, if you, um, your interrupt controller is capable of uh, dealing with, uh, with fast EOI. Um, things like setting the trigger type. So that's really configuring and interacting with the hardware at a very low level. So that's, that's the first thing you're going to implement. Oh, I need to, to drive that piece of hardware, or just going to add these functions that, uh, that deal with it directly. IQ domain is a much more abstracted thing. So first, it's usually tied to a firmware description. So if, you're, if you have a device tree, the, it will be tied to the, to the OF node that corresponds to that um, interrupt controller. So we, we tend to tie an IQ domain to an interrupt controller. They, they really go hand in hand. And that, that's really useful because we can represent hierarchies. Like we can say this device points to this um, RQ controller in DT, you have a, an interrupt parent property somewhere, and that gets represented as well in the, um, in the kernel. So we know that, for example, that, that interrupt uh, domain, that RQ domain corresponds to that uh, RQ chip. Also, we have a way to convert, um, let's say, for example, a, a, an interrupt specifier in DT to something that the kernel actually understands, which is an ID, an interrupt controller specific ID, which we call hardware IQ, which is really the, if you look at the data sheet of, a, of an interrupt controller, it will say, oh yeah, pin number two is interrupt number two. So that in your DT, you'll put a two somewhere, and that's your hardware IQ. That's really tied to that particular interrupt controller, and that's only valid at that level. It has no global meaning. We also get things like, your trigger type from DT or ACPI or whatever firmware description you could um, use. Well, Linux has only these two so far. Um, also, and that's the most important thing, it can, from this hardware RQ, this local um, value, can give you the corresponding Linux view of an interrupt, which is an RQ desk. Well, either an RQ desk or uh, an interrupt number these are actually the same thing. So it has nothing to do with this 
local number, it's something global that the kernel really understands and deals with. When you do request RQ, that's, that's the, this virtual interrupt number, that's this global space we're using. And we get onto RQ Desk. So RQ Desk is that global view of an interrupt. It's a fairly big data structure. That's all kind of states, which we're not going to even delve into it. It's really, really big. Uh, contains all the core stuff, all the states. That's where Linux is going to keep, really, um, at any point in time, okay, which state that interrupt is in. Is it in? It's, a, it's the threaded interrupt. Is the handler running? Uh, have we disabled something? Is it masked? Um, has it fired too many times? Counters, everything will be there. And there's this one-to-one -one mapping with the interrupt number. RQ data, um, until very recently, was only embedded into RQ desk. And then that's the link between your RQ chip and the RQ desk. It contains both this global interrupt number and the local one. It really allows you to, to go from the, from the virtual number, the global number, to the local one. You have to go through RQ domain to, go to, to do the inverse translation. So these are the basic four data structures we're dealing with. No question? Nobody's lost? I hear someone snoring. So <clears throat> when we start taking an interrupt, let's say, wow, where's the pointer? No, it's not that. Come back. Ooh. So let's say this device generates an interrupt. So the CPU is going to oh, access the, the interrupt controller, read a hardware register here of some sort. It's going to say, oh, hardware interrupt number two has fired. What am I going to do with that? So we, we from the hardware interrupt number, we ask the RQ domain, well, what was it? We get an RQ desk, well, actually the virtual interrupt number, but that's, that's, that's a one-to-one -one relationship. And with that, the, um, the core kernel is just going to tackle the, the interrupt, just executing the, your backends at the RQ chip level. It's really, really, really simple. There's, there's no magic. The, the real magic happens here when you are able to convert the RQ chip, the, um, the RQ chip local view of an interrupt into a global one. And that, that is populated through device tree, for example, or ACPI. So quite often we, we need more than a, a handful of interrupts your interrupt controller can do. I mean, you can, I mean this uh, Chromebook here, the, the gig on, on, on this machine has, I think, 256 interrupts. The, the system is using 300 and something. Obviously, you need to, to do something. So we tend to do these chain interrupt controllers. On this machine, there's two of them. You know, for an extra 40 or so interrupts. Um, so how does it work? Well, it's, it's quite easy. You dedicate one input line of your primary interrupt controller, and you dump um, another interrupt controller on it. And like that, you, mul you multiplex things. Um, but that's, yeah, we've been doing that for ages. The, every x86 system has one, even if they're not using much of it these days. Um, so that requires a, a two-level handling. Uh, you, you, you need to act at the first, at the primary control level, and then go up to the secondary level. Um, there's a whole set of uh, API to deal with that, but please never treat that as a normal interrupt handler. This chain handler is really, really specific. It's not even a real handler. It's actually a flow handler. So that has, it has a real meaning in the in the RQ subsystem as really not a normal um, device driver handler. <clears throat> and that's how it's handled. It's a bit uh, wow, overwhelming. Uh, that's only the beginning, I'm afraid. <laughs> so what happens? Sa same scenario. The, your primary interrupt controller fires. Uh, what's the hardware IQ number? Uh, that's the one. Um, 
RQ2. I'm going to resolve that to my uh, intra, uh, RQ domain, get the RQ desk. At that point, I kick a, a chain handler here. That brings me to the, the secondary domain corresponding to that interrupt controller. From that interrupt controller, I resolve its own hardware RQ, resolve it into the top level RQ desk. And only at that point, I'm able to start actually executing the handler. So it's quite convoluted. Um, it involves reading two hardware registers. It's not going to be fast. And if you were at uh, uh, Linus Valle's talk um, a few minutes ago, uh, he will have explained that, yeah, you can also have these over an I square C bus. Um, and yeah, that's really, really not going to be fast. But yeah, that's useful. I mean, you don't need to have you know, fast interrupts all the time. You, you know, sometimes you can just take your time. So as most people are using device tree, I hope, any, any SCPI fanboy in the room? No. Oh, there's one. Thank you. <laughs> we did it one. Um, so how does it work? So we have this uh, device here that's connected to that interrupt controller here, which we find here. So itself, it has an interrupt. And where is that interrupt going? Well, for, to find out, because there's no interrupt parent property here, we have to have a look at the default that's up there. So that's the gig. So we find that this interrupt is plugged in this interrupt controller, which is cascaded into this one. And don't be fooled by this interrupt here, which is a, a private interrupt to the gig, which itself can interrupt, generate an interrupt. That's for, for virtualization. Should have removed it from the, from the example. It's a bit confusing. But if you ignore that, that um, silly interrupt here, you find the cascade we just, um, we just uh, shown before. Um, so that gives you the, the, the full interrupt path in DT. It's pretty, uh, pretty easy to read. Um, and if you haven't done anything silly, the interrupt won't, the, the chain interrupt won't appear in proc interrupts. If you, if you ever implement a cascaded um, RQ chip, and if you find the cascade interrupt in proc interrupts, you're doing something wrong. You're using the wrong kind of handler and your system is broken. Do not do that. I know it's, everybody likes to have pretty numbers in, uh, in their proc files and they all hack to, like to hack CPU info, and, uh, but no, don't do that. If, it's, if it appears there, it's wrong. It's because you've, you've told the kernel that it was a normal interrupt and it's likely that you can generate a deadlock with that. Now, uh, multiplexing is not everything. Um, there's a number of cases, and uh, actually more and more cases, where we end up having interrupt controllers or things that process interrupts that are, don't have um, an end-to-one -one relationship, but instead a one-to-one -one relationship. So they have as many inputs as they have outputs, and yet they have an impact on the, um, on the interrupt signaling. So they can be things like interrupt routers. You, know, you, can, you can imagine this thing as being some kind of crossbar and being able to have some internal routing completely programmable. Or that can be um, a, a wake-up system, a wake-up controller. When that, it, if you suspend your system and that interrupt controller, which is the primary one, goes off, you know, it's being powered off, you need something to wake up your CPU. So you can imagine that here, on receiving an interrupt, you have some lines in parallel coming here. And in normal, when you normally drive the system, this is completely transparent. You, you really don't see it, but you might just intercept things and stash them somewhere for, for later use. And you have things like programmable line inverters. That, that sounds completely silly, but yeah, people do that. So if you have a, um, where, where am I going again? Doesn't work. Well, never mind. Um, on, the, on, the, on the far right, um, if your interrupt is only capable of, let's say, level high, and all your devices are level low, 
um, well, you want to be able to, to invert the signal. So you could just put an inverter directly on the board. People seem to think that, no, it's better to have it programmable. Just more chance to, to screw it up. It's always a good thing. Hey, it's the, don't want to miss an opportunity, really. Um, so we, ha we have this, um, this kind of thing, and yeah, they exist, they're programmable. If you don't program them, they will do, they will do the wrong thing. Um, so they're not necessarily really interrupt controllers. It's just that it is extremely convenient to represent them as such. Um, we don't really want to invent a new class of you know, intra rewriters or something like that. So yeah, we call them you know, RQ chips just like any other thing. Um, and yeah, we call these uh, URQ call or, or stack configuration. So <laughs> even more diagrams. I have worse, don't worry. <laughs> really, <laughs> you won't be laughing for long. Um, so how does it work? Uh, well, it's, it's fairly similar to, to what we've seen so far. It's just that we've, we've had to tweak things a tiny bit at the data structure level. So first, one thing. Um, remember, with the cascaded um, scheme, we had two RQ desks, one per interrupt controller, because they were effectively two different interrupts. Here, because we have this one-to-one -one relationship, we want to make sure that the RQ desk is constant for the whole signal path across um, all the interrupt controllers. That's really important. We don't want to have to recompute uh, the, the, the Linux interrupt number. We don't want to, to have to allocate another RQ desk. It's pretty expensive. There's tons of, of state in that. That'd be silly. So what we've done is um, we've taken that RQ data, which is uh, normally embedded in RQ desk, and yeah, we've, we've, we made a standalone version. It's the same data structure, it's just we can also allocate it um, separately. Another thing we've done is that we've introduced this, um, these parent pointers pointing towards the, towards the CPU side. And that gives us the representation of a chain. Um, an interesting thing to see is if you follow the, the pointer, we, we process the interrupt in, in the signal order, whilst with a cascaded case, we're effectively processing the, the interrupt in reverse order. Well, that's a much, much nicer way of, of, of doing it. So what happens? When the interrupt fires here at the top level interrupt controller, same thing, we find out the, the interrupt numbers, still interrupt number two, um, resolve it with the RQ domain, and wow, we end up at the top level here, at the RQ desk level. And from there, we're able to walk the chain, and for each RQ data we, we, we find, we call the corresponding RQ chip. And either we, we do some local processing or not, and we pass the, the control to the next one following the, uh, the parent pointer in the RQ data structure, or we can even cut it short if we know that, yeah, there's no further processing to, to be done. And that's a, that's a pretty powerful construct. I'm going to see uh, what we can do with that. Question. Yep. I, I'm not sure when you receive calls are happening. I mean, the method when which of the structures actually point to the handler. So that's the, uh, the, the, the handler. The handler is, the, is in the RQ. Uh, it's not what I wanted to do. Come back. Um, the envelope is in the RQ desk. That's where it's stored. And so when the data is called IRC chip, what, what is happening? So at that level, we are, so for example, if, you want, if you're going to mask your, your interrupt, you you, you've taken the, the interrupt. You want to mask it. You're going to iterate over the RQ data, calling mask at every level, if necessary. You may, you may cut it short and say, oh, well, once I've masked it here, oh, I know it can't happen uh, below there, so I'm going to you know, return immediately and there's no need for further processing. So it's reading flags? Uh, it could read flags. It can, usually it has the knowledge what it's plugged on. So all these 
secondary or you know, stacked in trap controllers, they, they know perfectly what they are stacked upon. So they know that, for example, we, I know that this inverter is stacked on top of a gig, and it's, it's, it will, pr it will um, carry on sending the, um, in pro processing the, the, the mask operation at the following level. So that, that's really a, a way to chain um, elementary operations at the, uh, at the, the various levels of your interrupt chain. So that, that, that won't impact the way you, you actually perform the handling of, um, of your interrupt. That, that will still be a, a call of the, the handler that's stored over there. So yeah, so we walk that chain in, in, um, in signal delivery order, and, uh, and we have this option of uh, carrying on uh, the, the chain or just cutting it short. So in DT, um, that looks almost similar. Um, so here we have this, um, this UART, for example, that has a, um, a single interrupt. And so we don't have an interrupt parent here, but yeah, we have this one here. So we use this SysAlq, which is the, the infamous uh, inverter. So we go here, the, which this one has as the interrupt parent the gig. Funnily enough, if you want the, to terminate the, the chain of interrupt controllers, you have to be a parent of yourself. So the, the geek is its own parent, it's a bit weird. That's how DT works. A um, couple of things. Uh, here we don't have any, um, any interrupt specifier, which is by design. Uh, we don't want to use interrupt specifiers for this kind of configuration, because effectively the interrupts that are, but the interrupt lines that are used are used by the device itself and not by the intermediate pieces of IP. And using an interrupt specifier would say, oh, here, I am using this, um, this interrupt myself. So in that case, um, implicitly, this interrupt controller cover, covers all the lines uh, provided by the gig. If you have restrictions, you can have a, an ad hoc property and describe a range or discrete lines and, and any way you see fit. Um, and that's about it. So, yes, here we, we use the, the same interrupt specifier as for the gig. That's a, that's a feature of, the, of this interrupt control, which has, this, has decided to use the same um, the same interrupt specifier. It could be different. Um, that's completely um, up to whoever writes the DT and the code. So there's, there's a bit more than, uh, than wired interrupts, thank God. There are the MSIs. MSIs are really, really interesting. So an MSI, for those who, of you who have never to deal with it. It's just a 32 bit write um, from a device to another device. So, from a, a device that generates an interrupt to a device that is uh, usually an, an interrupt controller, an MSI controller. So, the, the location where you, you write that message um, is called the doorbell. So, it's a device. Again, it's um, usually have a close relationship between the data you write and, uh, and the interrupt number or the, the interrupt vector that is generated on the other side of the, of the interrupt controller. So you can, it can be, for example, if you write, if you write 20 as a, as a value, you could generate interrupt 20. You could generate interrupt 2000, depending on the, on the interrupt controller you have, whether it's, it's something really simple or really complicated. By definition, it is uh, edge triggered. You can't, that's, if you write something, it's, it's, a, it's a one off event. There's, there's no notion of holding a line. So it's really similar to an edge triggered um, uh, configuration. There's, I, I've seen interrupt controllers doing level triggers, level triggered MSIs, but they end up having a, a right to set high and a right to set low. So that's a bit, uh, a bit weird. Um, so why, why MSIs? Uh, 
there's two, there's two really good reasons. One is when you design a, an SOC, if you have tons of devices on it, like people like to have, you end up with tons of wires going all the way from the center to the periphery. And routing those signals is a pain. You get this, this spider web of, of interrupt lines that you know, cross over the buses, and yeah, it's a pain to route. Um, so if you, if you have a, a, already a data bus that is present, uh, it makes some sense to route the interrupt data on top of it as well. Uh, you already have 64-bit you know, worth of wires, so that might always, as well use them. Um, more importantly, even, is if you think of DMA, your, your device is writing a lot of, memory, a lot of, of uh, data to memory and then raises an interrupt. If, if you don't use the same transport, you may end up in a situation where you raise your interrupt whilst the data is still in transit, you know, in some buffer somewhere. And by the time your CPU handles the interrupt, the data still hasn't made it there, and you read, you read stale data. By using the same conduit, you effectively guarantee, or you should guarantee, that by the time you get the interrupt, the data has made it to memory. It really it guarantees that it pushes the data that's in front of it. Uh, sometimes that's wishful thinking. But that's, that's what an MSI guarantees. But as always, we have bugs. Um, so historically, that's been uh, fairly tied to PCI. If you look at the kernel, you'll find that mostly PCI implements MSI until very recently. We didn't have any, any support for anything but PCI. But it's been present on, on all kind of buses, including things that are, are not buses. So any device these days uh, can, uh, can implement a, something that looks like an MSI. So we've decided at some point, uh, I think it was something like 18 months ago, that uh, it would be nice to support MSIs in a really, really generic way. And there's been a lot of, um, of discussion between uh, Thomas Gleisner, Jiang Lui, who was at Intel at the time, and myself, um, to find out how we would structure things. And we wanted to support a, a wide area of, wide range of, um, of really sometimes a bit bizarre hardware, where there's, there's the Intel um, uh, DMAR, which remaps memory, but also remaps interrupt. Uh, the, the, what concerns me the most, which is the, the Geek V3 ITS, which is, can be seen as uh, page tables for interrupts. Don't laugh, really. <laughs> it's really good, it's really fun. Um, there's something like a Freescale um, um, MC bus, where they have um, discrete functions that they can assemble into um, a virtual device that pops up on the bus automatically and generates well, things that look like MSIs. Some platform devices, USB 3.0 can have MSIs even implemented as a platform device. And we have this thing called uh, <coughs> MBI Gen, which is, uh, yeah, we'll see later, interesting. So. Also, one of the um, design goals was to be able to nicely fit with the um, existing, existing uh, PCI MSI implementation. Really don't want the x86 guys to come at me with, a, with an ax. I'm not prepared for that. Um, it turns out that the, um, the hierarchical domains are really, really nice for that. Um, we managed to implement most of it in core code. Um, not architecture specific, not bus specific, really, really nicely, um, I think. Um, and with uh, just a few front ends that are bus specific. And we're going to see why. So how does it work? So we've added two methods to our Q-chip. Uh, one is a method that composes a message. So by composing a message, I, what I mean is, put in that structure an address and a, and a piece of data. So the address is the doorbell address. The data is the, what, you want, what the device needs to write in order to generate a given interrupt. 
So that is completely bus agnostic. Whatever bus you're on, you always write this data to that address. And we have a second function that um, is going to write, configure a device with that address and that data. And that is extremely bus specific. I mean, if you, if you have a PCI device, you always write into that MSI bar and nowhere else. That's where the, the, the thing goes. You, you have an MSI or MSIX bar, and you're going to, to put that into the MSIX table. So that has, that has to be um, bus specific. And also we have um, an MSI domain info which we use to describe things. So if you remember, in D, with DT, we had a way to you know, establish links. Um, MSIs are completely programmatic. There's no way to describe an MSI in DT because there's, there's simply, it's, it's a pure software construct. You just say, write this piece of data somewhere. So we need a way to, to express that um, in code, really. So what we have here, if I can find my pointer, yeah. Um, so that's for a PCI setup. So we have an RQ chip here that implements MSI. And as the write message, we have this standard function that you know, PCI MSI domain write message. It's pretty obvious what it does, at least I hope. And we have this structure, MSI domain info, which has a number of, um, of flags. Uh, this one says, yeah, use the default operations for, for the domain, use the default operation for the, for the RQ chip, and yeah, we support MSIX and not only just plain MSI. So we can have up to 2K interrupts instead of just 32. And yeah, the pointer to that RQ chip. And then what we do is, let's create that MSI domain here. So based on, based on, on my hardware domain, a hardware domain, I, I get a, a virtual domain that is specialized for MSI. So if your interrupt controller is capable of doing something that looks like MSI, you can, on top of that, build a pure software construct that deals with PCI. And on top of the same hardware, you can build something that is going to, to do platform MSI, something that we did, were, were not able to do before. Same thing, it's even simpler actually, because most of the, most of the data structure can be given as empty and use the, the default ops to, to fill them in. The, the framework will, will cater for that. And we have the same, the same kind of function where on top of the, the RQ domain that implements our, our core um, MSI functionality, we specialize it. So that looks like this. So that's very similar to what we've seen before, except that here we have this glaring hole because where we had before um, a stacked interrupt controller, well, uh, we just have a a virtual RQ domain that represents a view of a specialization of your MSI hardware for a given bus. But otherwise, it's exactly the same functionality. You will take your interrupt, go to the RQ desk, and for any of the RQ chip operation, do the same dance going through the, the various data structure. And that makes it really easy to um, if you build a new bus, like the, the, um, the Freescale bus we've, we've talked about before, um, it's, it's about I don't know, 80 lines of code to support an, an entire bus and provide an MSI functionality. As long as you have that, that core functionality of being able to generate an MSI. Though platform MSI is a bit bizarre in a way. A platform device is, I mean, there's no such thing as a standard platform device. They are, they are all different. They like to be different. They're all special. We're all special. Um, and so there's no real easy way to, 
to write that function that, that is going to program your device to, to actually put the doorbell and the data into it. There's no standardized bar like, a, like on PCI. So the workaround for that is that when you, when you do create your, your, platform, uh, your platform device, when you attach your, your platform device to your MSI controller, and you allocate your MSI here, well, you're going to pass that function, which you've written specially for your little uh, device. So that's for the uh, ARM SMMU V3. It's just an extract of it. I've, I've removed tons of, uh, of things. So you, you allocate a bunch of MSIs and tell the kernel, well, by the way, when you, when you program the, when, you, when you've allocated everything, please call that function um, so that I can write the, um, the MSI configuration into the device. And you can, say, you can see, well, we compute the doorbell from the message. Well, it's 232-bit words, we compute a 64-bit one. And we write the data into some, uh, some configuration register here. And then we can here iterate and, uh, and find out what the RQ was, was and do the request RQ and all that. It's pretty neat. But yeah, that really allows for about anything. Any, any bizarre device you could have, um, you can implement something with that. And yeah, and that's, that's where shit hits the fan, really. Uh, because the interrupt strikes back. And yeah, we thought that, yeah, now that we have MSIs for everyone, uh, everybody's going to be happy and we can have, you know, at the periphery of our SOC, we can have everything talking MSI. Except that now people want to put wired devices there again, and we're gone full circle. So that's the case of the um, high silicon MBI gen and, um, and a few others, apparently, so I've heard. And so how does it work? This, um, so let me find it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's this um, wired MSI bridge. So it, it takes um, wired interrupts as an input, and for each of these inputs, it can generate a, a separate MSI to the interrupt controller. Okay, so how do we deal with that? So this, uh, this interrupt controller, this um, MSI bridge is, um, is a, is a device, a platform device, um, just like the um, SMM you have shown before. So one thing we can do is, um, instead of when we allocate these, um, these MSIs, instead of you know, giving them as, a, as discrete interrupts, what we can do is pack them into um, an IQ domain. Way! <laughs> so we can stack that IQ domain on top of the one we already have. And... Uh, and it turns out that that's pretty easy. I mean, it's, uh, it's probably 100 lines of code. Uh, took us some time to figure it out. But once you get the, the idea, it really falls into places pretty, pretty nicely. Um, and it, it just works just like the, the, the previous example. You, you take that interrupt, you go all the way, you pass your, your parent data. Just, yeah, I don't know what to say. I don't, don't even know why I wrote that slide. It's so easy. <laughs> so the important thing is here, you need to have a something that is going to have an, an identity mapping between the wired interrupts and um, the MSIs that are going to be generated. And so the code is uh, for the, um, the MBI gen is a bit convoluted, but not that much, actually. So I have to read it from the bottom, as usual. So here we create... Um, you have this uh, platform MSI create device domain. So it creates a domain for this device, this number of pins, pass that function that programs the MBI gen for MSIs, takes a number of um, operations, which are pretty generic, which I've, I haven't even bothered copying, and some, some platform data, uh, just that, that's going to be passed here. If you look at the, um, the alloc so we have this, uh, this allocation structure, this allocation function, sorry, um, which translate the, um, 
the, the, the firmware spec that comes from the device tree because all of a sudden we're back into device tree land. We, 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 we thought, oh yeah, we, now that we have MSI, we're completely abstracted from firmware. But all of a sudden, these devices that are connected to, with a physical wire um, to, the, um, to the MBI gen need to be dis uh, described in the device tree. So here we go. We, we translate them. We allocate the, um, the, the MSIs for that, do a bit of processing, and you know, treat that as a, as a normal interrupt. We, we wire it with this, uh, the data that's going to be used, the, the uh, MBI um, RQ chip. And uh, yeah, that's the normal uh, interrupt controller. It's really um, a bit of a schizophrenic um, piece of kit. On one side, it's, a, it's an MSI client. On the other side, it's, a, it's an interrupt controller. There are some drawbacks as well, because there's something that still doesn't work properly on Linux, which is um, dependencies, probing order for this, uh, for this kind of thing. Uh, it's likely that you'll have to to do some probe defer absolutely everywhere if you want to guarantee that things are going to be probed uh, in the right order. But yeah, one problem at a time, I suppose. Yep. Yeah. So the, the message, so the the message is actually passed to that function here, so which I haven't copied here. But if we go back to this, as the equivalent of that function, which take a message as a parameter. So when you've requested your your MSIs, you've asked the the call code to allocate a number of MSIs. For each of those, you allocate NVEC MSIs. For each of those, you're going to call that function here and program the, um, the, door, the doorbell and the data into your device. So is there a table of strings somewhere where there's messages in them then? Yes, so we, ha we have, so there's another uh, data structure which I haven't described here, which is MSI desk, which is, which is as associated to an ARQ data, to each ARQ data and contains the, that message as well. And that creates the link between the, uh, the Linux IQ number, the device, and the, the message itself. But yeah, if I couldn't put all that on, the, <laughs> on, a, single, on a single slide. So uh, as I'm about to run out of time, I wanted to show you why it looks like this kind of thing on an ARM64. So we usually start with a, on a modern system, we have a gig v3, which is on its own pretty simple. And then usually we have the ITS. So all that are just RQ domains. I haven't bothered uh, showing the devices themselves um, or the various linkages. So that's the one that does uh, uh, page tables for interrupts. And we have both uh, platform MSIs and, and PCI MSIs. And uh, yeah, it's not uncommon to see these, uh, these MSI, I mean, wired to MSI bridges as well. And now we, if we start adding uh, the devices, so we have a bunch of devices uh, wired, uh, some uh, platform MSI stuff. We have a PCI root complex that does uh, either legacy interrupts or MSIs. And the worst part is this, is that you can replicate it as much as you want. Um, you know, um, it's not uncommon uh, to have several instances of all that. You know, that, that's, uh, that's, that could be a socket or actually a, 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 um, an IO subsystem in a socket, um, which is not uncommon at all. And that's where I stop, because you could, you could carry on like this uh, for, for a long time. But that's about it. Any question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are the main system already done? Is the work done? Yeah, yeah. That's all, that's all in mainline. Uh, if it wasn't mainline, I wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> I just, uh, it took me five evenings to understand how to use uh, IQ domain API properly. There is 
Oh, you were, you were pretty quick. <laughs> there is an old API and new one which, uh, which is enabled when R2 domain configured in the zone. And yeah. uh, for example, for x86, it works. But I used a um, function from old API, R2, doma R2 create mapping. Yeah. It worked. By my request, R2 failed. And it, it took me a lot of time to understand why. Because it was just R2 chip which it was not initialized. Yes. So the the trouble is one of the issues is that actually RQ domain is a is a pretty old subsystem. It's been written by Ben Helen Schmidt uh, about ten years ago for PowerPC, um, and it has evolved a lot. Uh, one of the issues is that short of rewriting the whole of the PowerPC code, uh, which nobody wanted to tackle so far, we've carried on a compatibility interface which has some drawbacks, doesn't allow us to express everything. So what we have is some sort of compatibility layer and what we now consider as being the new core RQ domain. But yes, it's, it's a complicated mess. And I didn't want to go into how, how it's used um, internally because that's quite complicated. The, really the, the goal of that talk was to highlight how we can compose things. I agree with you, the, there's a, a big effort to be made on documentation and, and probably get rid of the old stuff. So if anybody is a PowerPC savvy and wants to have a go, please come and talk to us. I'd be much appreciated. Anything else? No? Well, in this case, I thank you very much. <laughs>